Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we're going to talk about Native American code talkers. Today is Native American Heritage Day, and November is Native American Heritage Month. And we would like to acknowledge the service of Native Americans and one of the uh, very special duties that they took upon themselves, uh, primarily in World War II, but in a couple other wars too. So, code talking. With military communications, it is important to encode your messages, particularly radio, uh, where you are broadcasting the message out and anybody who's on that channel can pick it up. So, you start to put it into code and various countries had various code machines. Uh, you've almost certainly heard of the German Enigma machine. The US had something similar. Uh, every country had some sort of machine which would substitute certain letters for other letters. Uh, and code talking is very similar to this, uh, except instead of using a mechanical device, which can be captured and then you've got a good head start on breaking that code, uh, it uses a language, usually a language that is uh, not written down and spoken by a minority of people. Uh, it's not always Native American languages. There are certain ethnic African and European languages that have also been used for this, but Native Americans are by far the most famous, and the most famous among the Native Americans for this are the Navajo code talkers of World War II. These Navajos served in the Marine Corps in the Pacific during World War II, uh, and famously, in some of the later battles of the Island Hopping Campaign, particularly Iwo Jima, uh, they were able to accurately send and decipher spoken word messages over the radio without the code ever being broken. Now, we'll come back to the Navajo in a minute. They were not the first Native Americans used in the U.S. military for code talking. The Comanche... Uh, language was first used in World War I during the Battle of the Somme. It just so happened that a certain number of Comanche uh, ethnic people were in one of the American infantry divisions during the Battle of the Somme. And um, at that time, it was very common for military units to be grouped by home location unlike today where a military unit is made up of people from all over the country it was very common for people to be from the same region uh, in world war one and so getting a couple of comanche all in one unit it's not a surprise uh, what was a surprise is these guys were able to use their language and they made this up on the spot in the middle of the battle um, and because it was a language that nobody else spoke or understood they were able to send encoded messages Following World War I, the Germans knew what was going on here. So the Germans sent a team of anthropologists to the American Southwest to try and learn the various native dialects. They only sent 30 people. They were only there for a couple of years. So you certainly can't learn a bunch of languages in that time. Um, this did keep the U.S. military from deploying uh, Native American code talking languages in Europe extensively. However, the Cherokee language was used during the uh, invasion of Normandy as a coded language, and a couple other languages were used by the army throughout the war. Um, now, coming back to the Navajo in the Pacific, Navajo code talkers were used extensively by the U.S. Marine Corps and there were several assigned to each of the Marine Corps divisions as code talkers. And their job was primarily to send messages from the troops ashore to uh, batteries, gun batteries behind the lines or during amphibious operations uh, to the battleships and other cruisers of the shore bombardment force that uh, was laying offshore to provide naval gunfire support. Uh, I am 
not aware of any specific instance that New Jersey responded to Code Talkers in shore battery support during the Battle of Iwo Jima, in which Code Talkers were used extensively. New Jersey was escorting the carrier Essex and not providing naval gunfire support. However, other similar battleships were. Um, it is possible that because New Jersey was a fleet flagship, that there were code talkers on board. But again, I'm not 100% sure. I haven't seen any exact documentation that says that this Native American was with Spruance's staff, Halsey's staff, whatever the case may be. Uh, that said, some of the battleships almost certainly had code talkers on board because these calls for fire support were sent and received. Uh, and what was remarkable about the Navajo language was one, it was not written down at that time. So completely unbreakable. In fact, it is the only known code uh, to this day that has not been broken. See, the more you send a coded message, the easier it is to break it. The, the larger your sample of things, uh, it, it becomes easier to break the code. And oftentimes, following a war, if everybody knows, hey, you're using this code, well, then they go out and uh, figure it out so you can't use it in the next war. Well, the Navajo language was used in World War II, Korea, and the Vietnam War, all without being broken before it was retired. So, how did the code work? Uh, there's two ways of encoding. It's pretty simple. Certain Navajo words were used to substitute for English letters. So over the radio, you would basically spell out the words you wanted to say. Uh, oftentimes, these words are not like, hey, what's up? What's going on? Things like you text. It's grid coordinates. Like, we want fire support on grid square A123. So if it was actual common words, it would be fairly easy to decode. All right, we have all these three-letter words. It's probably the, so now we know what the T, the H, and the E is. No, it was, it was a lot of random grid squares, which would have required the code-breaking uh, enemy forces to get the map with the grid squares on it, get somebody who spoke the language, and then um, figure this out from their radio logs. Uh, and there were so few Navajo speakers, particularly outside of the United States that this was this proved to be impossible. Some words are used commonly enough that uh, they just got their own code word substituted in. So rather than having to spell out uh, battleship every single time you're sending a transmission, uh, you would say, I want gunfire support from the whale use an existing Navajo word to substitute in for battleship. Because you're doing direct substitutions like this, even if you have a uh, Navajo speaker on the other end who isn't indoctrinated with the code, let's say the Japanese have captured a, a Navajo civilian and they put them on the radio to, to listen to what's going on, they hear that they won't come fire support from a whale. They don't, they don't know what whale means. Does it mean cruiser, destroyer, battleship? Who knows? And so the code proved to be extremely successful. If you are interested in the Navajo language and the code, uh, we've put a link to a code book and an activity in the description down below. Feel free to read through what some of those words are. Keep in mind, code talkers would never take their code books in the field. They would memorize them stateside when they were training, and then they would deploy without any of that stuff written down. But give that a look through and see how effective it is for you. Today, we're filming this video in our World War II radio room. This space was used for other purposes later in the ship's career, but our volunteers have restored it with working, period-correct equipment. Uh, and we still do transmit out of this room 
on occasion. If you're interested in this sort of thing, ham radio operator or whatnot, the Battleship has a radio club. Check the link in the description uh, for a way to volunteer on the ship if you want to join them, uh, or just to tune in and see if you can ever reach the Battleship when we're on the air. Thanks for watching. Remember, if you have any questions, drop them in the description down below. We are pretty active in getting back to people on their questions. Battleship New Jersey receives support from the New Jersey Department of State and from viewers like you. If you would like to support the museum or our YouTube channel, there's a link in the description to a GoFundMe page. Any donations you make there goes directly back into this channel. As always, thanks for watching. Remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when we put out new content. We're still putting out new content several times a week.